phone. It's fantastic. Yeah, luckily we didn't do it yesterday because our internet was down. Oh no! Well, this is a good day then. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> so, Cyrus, welcome for joining me on Naughty Bites podcast. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm so excited to have you here. But I have to ask you one question. My my podcast is called Naughty Bites. Yeah. What is your go to secret salty or sweet treat you eat secretively away from your family? Away from my family. Yeah. There are, you won't mind that I'm very near the airport, so there's aircraft taking off and on, yeah? That's fine, it's fine. I'll, I'll zone it out. So, so, secrets. I think there are certain things I am very naughty about. <laughs> and my wife tells me, you are disgusting. But, uh, <laughs> there are a couple of things. One of them is this uh, very traditional Parsi biscuit. Okay. That, uh, that the Dutch left behind in Surat. Okay. And a Parsi gentleman called Dotiwala bought the biscuit before the Dutch were ousted by the British. Okay. And we call it the batasa. Okay. Can it's you tell a, me more about a, that? It's a savory shortbread. Flavored with uh, either shahi jeera or caraway seeds or just cumin seeds. And some of the best ones are now baked in uh, Pune. Okay. Surat, and a couple of bakeries in Bombay. Now, if anybody brings those, my sister knows when she's coming next month to see me, there'll be at least eight or ten packets in her bag. <laughs> and, and I won't share them. <laughs> so I eat very early in the morning. My wife asked me just two days ago, where are the batasas that your sister sent? I said, there are two left. If you want get one, keep one for me. <laughs> oh, that makes me laugh. The you... other thing is that I, I grew up as a child in Rajasthan. In my mama's, uh, my matern maternal uncle's home. Okay. So it was highly asthmatic and Bombay climate didn't suit me all the time. Yeah. And there in winter is a particular brittle called gajak. Now, gajak is made in many parts of India, but nothing is as good as the gajak from our town, Nimach, okay. which, which is one of the biggest peanut growing and uh, sesame seed growing regions in the country. Yeah. And gajak is a brittle which is made very different. It's not just a brittle. It is the, the sugar and the peanuts and the sesame seeds when they're cooked together. There mm -hmm. are specialist people who handle this hot, hot uh, nougat. Okay. And they bang it against a wall which has a big marble slab on it. Till oh, the goodness. peanuts and the sesame seeds are completely crushed inside. Wow. And with every hit, there's air incorporated. And when it's set, it, it sets like a, it sets in layers. Now, oh, that wow. is my all-time favorite sweet thing in the world. And when I get it, you can see me two in the morning hiding. And <laughs> I am, oh, my goodness. I am so sorry today that I never let my children develop a taste for it because I was too greedy. <laughs> so far away, I would not want to share it with anybody. That makes me, that makes me laugh because, you know, in Varodra, um, there's a famous, I don't know if it's from there, but I've never seen it in Nosari or that part of like Surat. But there is, I love Batra, like, you know, I, yeah. I love it. But it's they do, yeah, oh, I'm obsessed with it. But Varodra do one that's crispy fried Batra. Yes. And it's, it's like the texture of brittle. And I literally get a bag sent. And yeah. that's my uh, one of my other treats I do love because you can't buy that anywhere in the UK. Like it's not a thing. And it's whenever the family go to India, they do send it across. My mum used to make excellent patrel. We call it patrel from Patra, and you slice it thin. Yeah. You crisp fry it in a frying pan, very little oil, and that is the most amazing thing. It's always had with chai with tea. Yeah, that's how I have it's mine. You from next week. Oh. And I'm serving it on a bed of uh, spicy tarka dal. And it's top crispy fried rings of patra. Okay, if I was a day, I would just get fat. Because I'll just be eating everything from India. But like, I missed this. I've not had this for years. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so when I did a bit of research about you, a lot of things stood out for me. And I was just in awe over your experience. You're a restauranteur educationist, author, entrepreneur, the list is endless. But in the recent weeks I've got to know you, 
you're so down to earth and you're so curious and you're like an encyclopedia of India's history and facts. And just by my surname, you were like, right, you're Gujarati, um, but the Fernandez side, this is the Portuguese, is it this, is it this? And I was like, no, it's my husband's surname. <laughs> I'll put it in the mix. Um, but what I want to know is, why are you called the Chavi Master? <laughs> A Chavi Master? Where yes. did you pick that one up from? You told me. And I was like, I'm going to include this. <laughs> so... Oh, boy. Well, you have to ask my friends because if our friends have been quiet for too long, I have to wind them up to start an unnecessary conversation <laughs> or to get somebody into the thick of it. And I've, I'm known to be very famous for that, including with my staff. Okay. I wind one or two of them up and I disappear from them. I see those fireworks and then I enjoy that. I come back <laughs> up all down. But I do that with my relatives and my friends all the time. So every time they discuss about Chai, I say, this is nothing beats you and your Chavi. Because yeah. you end up winding everybody up and then you have a great laugh sniggering in the corner, watching the fun and then coming back into trying to resolve the situation. <laughs> so you're all about the musty and mayhem. <laughs> yeah, I do that, yes, quite often. <laughs> That's amazing. So you began your career um, at the Taj Hotel Group and you rose to become an executive chef. What was that experience like working across different groups throughout India in the Taj group? Uh, across different groups or across different hotels? Across different hotels of the Taj group. Ah, okay, because uh, I didn't work for any other group in India except that we went out and then went out on our own and joined a friend and opened a restaurant. But across different hotels, it's very, very, it's different because you're working, A, number one, we Indians have massive egos, okay? And that's a big problem with Indians. Working with Indians is trying to battle against egos. And I decided that I will never have one. I have an ego, but I'm never going to let it interfere with things because I need to be at ground level at all times. Because I alienate myself from people and I'm a people person. You know, I cannot live without people. And uh, so within the group, when you're moving from place to place, you understand each one. Because I must have been a threat for some of them. Okay. Okay, because I'm naturally inquisitive. I will try and better myself all the time if I can. And I pick up things very quickly. Okay. And that, that creates a problem for someone like me because others don't like that. Okay. They don't like that. And But when I actually was transferred to Goa, and I presume that being part of a Taj group, they would be much easy to manage to handle a kitchen and other things. Little did I know that I was being thrown into the deep end. Okay. Where the storekeeper perhaps didn't even know what good quality noodles were, for example. And the kitchen team were not used to a monster coming in and wanting 100% hygiene and cleanliness all the time. Okay. And then wanting to evolve the menu constantly. So bring other people in, bring ladies in, because women in India have the maximum food knowledge that we chefs will never learn. Mm. We will never know. It will die with those women. And I'm very yeah. curious to get as much as I can out of them, particularly Gujarati women, for example, because they don't share their secrets. And they, they don't. The they don't. They are the, and they're the best cooks in the world. They're the best in the world. So according to me, the Gujarati woman sits right up there, you know, because her skill levels are just phenomenal. Mm. But so that that was a very difficult few couple of years for me till people understood who I was, where I came from and things developed. So, for example, for no got, for no reason at all, whilst with the Taj group, I started a farm. I started a piggery. I thought that maybe there's so much food being wasted. We should breed our own pigs because they will eat mm -hmm. that food and then we can have our own pork, etc. Wow. I built a poultry farm. We had 5000 chickens. Oh my God. <laughs> we had a horticulture, so every time we came to Europe, I took loads of seeds back and we had a wow. beautiful nursery with lots of plants and herbs and everything else. And so the, the, it just went on and on and on. And it upset a lot of people. And as soon as I left the company, the person who took over destroyed and killed everything instantly. Because he said, I don't want that responsibility. I'm going to kill it. So everything okay. shut down. One by one, it all shut down. So it's... That it must have been seething in the hearts of people. So, yes, it's one of those issues. 
it yeah. works with people on the flip side of that the knowledge i gained from those experiences are um, life life giving knowledge you know it okay. is it, it enriches you so much mm-hmm. you work with one of the laziest people around which is the goan people in short you know very lazy very portuguese influenced by way of that sosegado what the portuguese call easy going life to get work out of them to be productive very difficult and you learn all that along the way mm. so every experience has its own uh, magical little kick to it and i think i had some of the finest people in the world to work with okay and uh, very loyal very good eventually everybody understood the kind of idiot i was and you know because It, that's the way i am okay so, yeah, you learn but if any every time i traveled within the group and i went somewhere else to do something you could see the heckles rising on the backs of the chefs over there yeah it's it's curious to say that like i've gone to india many times and i always felt at home in gujarat maybe because my family are from there and they settled there etc but i think you know you i always see women working And I remember I would have been about 12 and my grandmother said to me about Anisha you're going to milk the cows and I'm like really and she said you're going to milk the cows you're going to have your milk you're going to get the chicken the eggs from the chicken and you're going to need um cow dung with hay for the fire fuel so yep. you know when you have the sugri outside yep. I was doing that so my grandma was like you need to learn to appreciate everything nature gives you and how to use it in case of an emergency but also to understand the gujarati way of life as well yeah. like how people live fantastic um, and it it was a really good experience for me um but that woman god bless her like you said she never shared her secret she taught me how to cook but it was never the same like never the same and i remember she used to grow spanish uh, spanish sorry spinach um spanish spinach in her garden And when I would go there for, after university, she'd make me patras, like I said, to my favorite. I don't know how she'd do it, but she would do the same thing. You know, steam it and then cut it and then fry it with a little oil, sometimes with sesame seeds. And it was like magic on a plate. And um, I was like, how did you do this? She went, it's just, just the hand. It's just how you do it. Just watch me. And it was never the same. But I think those women worked so hard. and knew everything and anything about food like you would ask them something they would tell you it was just even seasonal things as well what to use and when to use it and not to have it all year round which is what i love about them women yep um but you know so you worked in the taj group did you have any sort of mentorship from anyone that was higher up or someone that you wanted to learn from specifically very 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 pertinent question actually and i have been asked that question a few times before i actually had no mentor okay many a times i felt my boss hated me okay because he was always after me always okay. and uh, maybe that did me a lot of good it me a lot of good without him understanding or realizing it because of the kind of push i got i learned a hell of a lot more than most other chefs did okay and which benefited me but the there was nothing that existed in india to talk about mentorship after i became an executive chef we had a new director of human resources a gentleman called mr mahesh okay uh, he <clears throat> he is south indian of course but he oxford graduate went to management school at cornell and he thought that the taj needed to a shift in policy about teaching its managers how to manage better Okay. and what one needs to do to understand your people your staff appraisals whatever else and that is the first time somebody actually ever came and told us what is right and what is wrong but mm-hmm. it also has to apply to your present circumstances okay that that that's one thing and there was an institute called icar the international some something of for management research or something like that that gave us the certificates to get involved in this program but by and large it was a typical management that you had to learn on your way up you learned on your way up there were very few people you looked up to you aspired maybe 
And when people ask me, did you know where your career would go? I said, no, because we were never told where we would go. Okay. We were never told to aspire. It was not, you didn't join the hotel to think I'll be executive chef one day because nobody left the jobs in those days. Today, there is a million opportunity out there. So people keep mm -hmm. moving jobs. In those days, you got stuck in one job. And the people I worked with had given 30 years of service, 35 wow. years of service in the company. And you realize that I'm not going anywhere. But then the company started to grow. And it started to have new hotels. So Goa opened up, Madras opened up, Udaipur opened up. And then people from the main hotel were moved. Okay. And that's how everyone grew. And that's how I grew, perhaps. So that was, that was the one thing. But you always met somebody whose points you liked. Mm -hmm. And you always met people along that whole management structure, which was, uh, I would not say that it was great. It wasn't well structured. You, it was how you knew and who you knew within the senior management to get to where you wanted to be. If not, someone like me who didn't bother about that took a longer time to proceed and progress. Okay. But so, yeah, go on. No, no, so I can, no, no, continue, continue. Yeah, so, but you looked at some of the foreign chefs as well. And I always aspired and I thought that time there was a gentleman called Mr. Anton Moziman. Mm -hmm. A very, very well-known, famous chef who has suddenly become famous in Britain. He became the chef of the Dorchester Hotel <clears throat> and things changed. And he was the first chef I know that conducted meetings, conducted staff meetings, had a discourse, got his staff to contribute towards how the menu should be formulated, what should be done. And I think it, in unconsciously, he became a kind of a mentor figure. Okay. Because instilled some sort of just organization in bringing your team together without being part of it, if that made sense. It's like you become a team. But everybody worked. Everybody wow. worked. Everybody knew what their job was. Everybody worked hard. Uh, some got away with no work at all because of the way the structure was. But <clears throat> the hotel group was very, very successful and is today very successful. I'm sure things have changed now. And mm -hmm. I'm sure there are better policies in place and there's a better HR machinery in place. We were, we were, we, when we joined, we feared the HR department. We were scared of them. We thought they were monsters mm -hmm. because that's the way it was portrayed to you. Okay. Always be afraid. Wow. It's, it's curious you say that. I think coming from, an, like, again, a South Asian family, you were, you were right about egos. Um, everyone has to be better and you don't want to disrupt that. But also as well, you're always scared to like, you know, when you have the elders, you don't, we were always taught you don't speak to the elders unless you're spoken to. And you were like, okay, okay. But now I look back and I'm like, I was always really inquisitive. And all my cousins say to me, you never stop. You always ask questions, ask questions. I'm like, yeah, because you live, life is so short. And unfortunately it is, it is short, but I want to absorb as much as I can to decide whether I want to, you know, make that choice or go somewhere else or do something else. And, you know, one thing I learned as well was, you know, so my, my, my parents were born in, in Kenya, but then they yeah. left because of the whole thing that happened in the 1960s with Idi Amin. But then I remember many years ago having a discussion with my cousin say, our Morning. grandparents' um, generation traveled a lot. Our parents' generation traveled a lot, but then we settled. And I was like, but I don't want to settle. I want to try something else, go somewhere else. And in the end, I ended up in Granada. And like you said, like the uh, from the comment, even here to do things, it's very manana. Everything yeah. is tomorrow. Yeah. So I feel like sometimes I'm going too fast in a slow paced life. Yep. And it's um, something I deal with a lot thinking, oh God, I need to get this done today. I want to do this. but. Sometimes you've got to go with the flow. So one of my questions as well is you're an, adv you're an advocate for education and you mentor your new chefs that work for you. Do you think that is a result of how you started off your career, like to give opportunities to people starting out in the industry? I think uh, maybe that didn't happen to me so much. So I made sure that I did what I had to do. So when I was first moved to Goa, we had no training program there. Okay. We had young people coming in. I still remember 
I hand did the entire training program because, of course, there was no computer in those days. Yeah. And I got someone to type it all up for me, and then we could cyclo style it. There was no photocopier in those days. Oh my gosh. And uh, every trainee, I mean, today some of those trainees have become executive chefs and have grown in different things. And it's lovely when they message me and chef, you made me who I am. Oh, that's lovely. And they are they are bigger and better than I am. And that's the whole part of life. You have to be. It's like a teacher. A teacher's success is the success of his students or her students. Definitely. And they see a light in the success of uh, what they have taught and trained and educated. And I think that that kind of lesson is very difficult for one to understand. Till mm. then, one day, because you hate them in school, and then after you leave school and you're sitting and thinking, this whole thing dawns on you. Mm -hmm. What is the legacy I might leave behind, and what is going to be my legacy? Okay, and that is something that must keep driving us. So that's why we have set up the Torivala Foundation. Mm -hmm. We do the Zest Quest Asia competition, and any money that we we can surplus from that, we will give to students that are unable to afford certain things within okay. wanting to become a chef. So they can't afford to buy knives, or they can't afford to buy uniforms, or they can't go to school. They can't by their rail pass or whatever and that is the whole idea just to keep making young people aware that there is a life out there and they should keep aspiring okay well which you've touched on a few points of questions i'm going to ask you but before i go on to them um you mentioned the how in india when you worked at the taj group you set up the piggery you know the the plot of land for vegetables and herbs etc um you recently, the, the question will form into it, but you recently hosted a benefit with Enzo Olivieri. Is that Olivier, correct? Yeah. Yesterday. Yes, yes, it was yesterday, the day before, right? Yeah. And you created a unique four course menu, but the whole point of this benefit was about the Marine Conservation Society. Yes. What's, you know, what's taken you down the route of sustainable? food, sustainable fisheries and, and seasonality? You're asking me very key questions. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody is asking this question. Okay, I go back. I mean, childhood, I learned a very, very important lesson. It's on BBC Two. It's on what they on BBC Radio 4, what they call uh, breakfast uh, tweets or whatever like that. Okay. And uh, good morning, madam. And uh, yeah, I forgot my laptop. Pervin just brought it for me. <laughs> and so, what happened was, on one of my birthdays, as a small young man, young boy, that got me a little air gun. Okay. And one day, just out of practice, I saw a little parakeet sit on the tree in front of me, and I shot it. Okay. Wow. And I killed it. I was very proud of myself that I could kill something. And that came and asked me, so what have you done? I said, I, say, I shot the bird. He said, why did you kill it? I said, I killed it. Does it hurt the bird? He said, of course it hurts animals. He said, you don't kill an animal unless you're going to eat it and you're going to mm -hmm. consume it or it's going to be some use to you. Are you going to eat the bird? I said, no, nobody eats parakeets. Mm -hmm. And he kept, I said, okay, pick it up, bury it. I buried it. One day I was doing something else, I was down the, halfway down the hill and I heard this crack of a gun and I okay. fell down okay. and this searing pain in my thigh, searing pain in my thigh and I was writhing in pain, I didn't know what had happened suddenly and then dad walked up to me with his air rifle which was twice the size of mine, okay, oh, God. Big. but he knew what he was doing and he came and asked me and I was crying, he said, you know, does it hurt you? I said, hurt me. I said, it's bad. It's painful. I've got this blood coming out. The slug was stuck in my thigh. Okay. He said, remember, animals feel pain. He said, you don't hurt animals unless you're going to consume them. Okay. Now, he was a crack shot. He used to go hunting. He loved wildlife. I mean, I grew up eating game all the time. And that lesson stood with me mm -hmm. for a very long time. And eventually, I got more and more involved in these things. When I was in Goa, I got involved in several activities. 
somehow the local people thought I was an animal doctor for some <laughs> godforsaken reason. And they would bring me sick animals. They would bring a snake, a cobra, a python, and uh, pangolins and stuff like that. And I would keep them. There's an area there where I keep them. I had a vet who was an excellent friend. He became, he would tell me, you know, give them this, give them that, and we'd look after them. And the ro- locals thought I was the man curing. <laughs> But I got more and more involved and then I got involved with uh, the conservation of turtles, the Olive Riley turtle, because the Goans would eat any damn thing under the sun. Okay. okay. If they landed on the beach, they wanted to kill the mother and eat the eggs up. Oof, and, okay. And dad's friends used to bring turtles' eggs to the office and they used to and they'd enjoy eating them. And I thought, you know, this creature, when this poor boom mother has traveled 5,000 miles from the Australian barrier reef, come all the way to Goa to lay eggs on the beach and they could be worth something. Why should we let them die? So after much arguments with the local people, I salvaged half the eggs and I incubated them and they hatched. And then I built a little pond and I kept a pump by the sea and we would pump fresh sea water into the pond every day. Till in about six, eight months, we kept them. And then one fine day, we had to release them. When I was releasing them, I released them and then a letter, a telex message came from Switzerland. One of our customers who had photographed them sent a message saying, please tell Mr. Todiwala not to release those turtles. More information follows. By that time, too late. We released them once. They came back because they had got used to us. We released them twice. They came back. Then we sat in a boat. We went out and we threw them into the water further out into the sea. Okay. Now, he told me that his brother was a curator of the Zurich Zoo. And he said, that is the rarest turtle species in the world, the Olive Riley. Okay. What he, you have achieved is 35% uh, survival as opposed to half a percent in the wild. Oh, my goodness. Okay. But too late. They're already gone. So, after that, I got involved with other things. And then the chief minister of Goa got in touch with me and asked me to join a committee that was involved in... Uh, preservation of Goa. Okay. And within that committee, we managed to earmark two sites that are still uh, sanctuaries. But he also made me Goa's first honorary wildlife warden. How does that feel? Uh, it, it was amazing. He given me some amazing powers. But the thing was that it was appreciated at that time at that level there. Mm-hmm. And then ever since then, it's always been part of my psyche. Mm. So you got, I've got involved with several things. I'm involved with the Rare Breed Survival Trust in this country, okay. the Marine Conservation Society, the Renaissance Movement for Mutton with Prince Charles, and various things. So sustainability is key. Then you grow up in Rajasthan and Devlali, where I was in school. No water, no electricity. You can't waste anything, like your grandma told you. You couldn't waste. So we grew up in that environment. And coming here, you see this colossal wastage. So in Goa, the whole idea of the piggery was to use the wasted food that was being thrown at the back where jackals and the dogs became more feral that they would be dumped in a big pit. Rather than that, I put it to use by breeding pigs. Okay. And so this, this whole cycle, and that's a very Zoroastrian principle in life. So when the Zoroastrian religion was established 3500 BC, the prophet Zoroaster said very clearly that man should never defile nature. And always work with nature. Yeah. So that's what we are. Your grandma told you that. Hey, what's mm-hmm. happened? Here? It's okay. yeah. So that went on and uh, got involved. Got involved. And then one one by one things happened and then you get caught up in these things and I enjoy doing it. That's a, that's incredible. I think you know, um living here we Carlos and I make sure that when we do our cooking, that we always buy what's in season. So we do go to the green grocers and they will say, right, this is in season, don't have this yet or have this yet. So even like, um, and I mentioned to Tony, your friend of the day, that when we have spinach, for example, I already have it when it's in season. So I have the whole spinach bunch, use everything. And I don't buy spinach in a bag. I will never buy it in a bag because I'm thinking, I enjoy it when it's in season because it tastes fantastic. It's, it's amazing. And I don't get to have it all year round, but I do enjoy that. And that that principle, so me and my husband apply that through our meals throughout the year because we are like, I'd like to support local 
farmers and local green grocers that make sure they get things from around Andalusia or Granada, for example. Um, so when you did your your menu, did you use sustainable fish? Because it was about the marine Very conservation question. society. Uh, the part of that is to make people aware of what is called the Good Fish Guide. Okay. You can download it on your phone. It's mm -hmm. called the Good Fish Guide by the Marine Conservation Society. That lists 156 species that are scientifically researched all the time. And if you look at that uh, app on the phone, yeah. and you say you've seen a, the famous Spanish merluta, for example. Yeah. Okay, it was on my menu that day because merluta is highly sustainable. Mm -hmm. Hake is sustainable. But at certain times of the year, the hake should not be eaten because it is spawning. Now, people will catch it and bring it and do whatever else with it. So you look at the app and you say, okay, I'm looking for hake. And it will tell you, sorry, at this moment, hake is on amber. You can eat it, but be careful. Okay. And so we were promoting the good fish guide and told everybody, please download that app now. Every time you go fishing, you first mm -hmm. look at that app. Every time you buy something, look at that app. The app will tell you whether that fish should be or should not be consumed. If more and more people subscribe to that app, and use it, then some of these fish that are caught throughout the year will not be caught. Mm. Because people will say, okay, I'm not being going to be able to sell it. So why am I fishing for it? Mm. And there are the, 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 that is one of the most critical things to promote to chefs. It's very difficult because the British public have been pampered. They eat maybe four or five of the top fish like cod and uh, maybe, maybe not, but haddock, cod, uh, and um, they like place, they like salmon, they like uh, halibut, and very little of the other fish they will eat. Okay. So as a result, it uh, creates a problem. It creates a problem, and um, they will uh, they will then. Uh, so this guide is designed to hopefully take people into a different uh, thought process and eat what is British as well as local mm -hmm. but at the same time be careful on what they're wanting to eat that's really good that's that's amazing because you know here it's what you're saying when to eat fish here in the months that do not have r so like may june july august yeah um we have a fish called speto i don't know what it is in english but similar to sardines yeah and that's the only four months you have it you have it at the coast and a lot of people have a boat, make it into a barbecue, and you just smoke it. Fantastic. Uh, oh, it's so good. When you do come here, if it's in those months, we have to go and try it because it is just amazing because they catch it fresh, yeah. and then you have it. Um, but it's curious that you say that to me. Like, you know, the British public have been pampered in terms of fish. However, I remember when I was studying food at university, so, um, one of the modules we had to understand food and where it comes from and also how to debone devein um fill it you know how to carcass and things like that and i remember when it came to fish a lot of the people i studied with were like eh, it's got a face oh like and i'm like I i'm sorry like where do you think it comes from um and i remember they were so picky about touching the fish because they, they, they would only have it deboned filleted and no skin so I'm like, you're truly spoiled, but it's so important yeah. to know yeah. that it is a living, you know, it is alive, it is living, you know, it's there for our benefit, for enjoyment, but you should also appreciate what it is and how to look, like, you know, to understand it, like clean it, appreciate it, be thankful that you have that. Um, and it was really curious thinking, and I was thinking, why are you studying food if you can't touch a fish? And it just made me wonder that. We have a lot of customers who won't eat fish with their heads on. Yeah, but I love it. <laughs> That's all we get. <laughs> just, just call Raju, please. He's been trying to contact me. Ah, okay, fine. Okay, Raju, bolo. Yeah. And okay. then, um, no, it's fine. And then, so you've got. I have to ask. You've got four restaurants. You consult for the Tesco's finest range. You have your own company of award-winning product lines of like pickles and, and spices. 
you have I think it's six six cookbooks, I think. More uh, or less. You have you have quite yeah, a few. Seven, yeah. How do you have time? And then you mentor chefs, you do things, you're an ambassador for many charities. How do you have time to stop and relax and be center yourself? Like how do you do it all? Very difficult to answer that. How do I manage? I do still manage somehow. Somehow. Still manage. I know there's not much time left in the day because half more than half my day goes cooking. Okay. And then by the time I get online, people get upset that I haven't responded to emails or I haven't done the certain things. That's one of those side effects of my involvement in many things. Mm -hmm. But I think we yeah, I I can't answer that question, but I do manage. But you, okay. So um you've been credited for using innovative fresh ingredients um in your approach to Indian cooking. Um but you're known for putting these Indian ingredients into something unexpected. What is the most unexpected dish you've ever created on in one of your restaurants? Oh boy. My goodness me. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> there are quite a few. Like example, <laughs> as a person very involved with the charity for the armed forces. Okay. Both. I mean, I'm not in the naval, but the air force and the army. Uh, we do every year a Burns Night to raise money for the Army Benevolent Fund. Mm -hmm. and in that, we use haggis in eight different kinds of preparations. Okay, I'm right? intrigued. Yes. Now, haggis is classically Scottish. And for them, there's one haggis, that's it. But not for an Indian. It has to, <laughs> it has to come in different forms. And to make it more exciting, make it more enjoyable, and make it more, uh, how would I say, edible across the taste buds of people. Okay. Because even a lot of British people are a bit repulsed with haggis sometimes, or the sheer mention of the word haggis. Because it's got a funny name, you can't help it. And that's one of those things that we turn around all the time. And there are many other things. Of course, the British would think that uh, we Indians don't eat game because most of us are vegetarian for some reason. Mm -hmm. But they forget that the pheasant came from China, the grouse came from India, the muntjac deer, what they have here, has come from India. And a lot of game was brought across into mm -hmm. this tiny island, which didn't have all those game at one time. And so to cook that and then present it to people in a very Indian kind of way, is something that uh, at one time was not accepted by people. Now the diners understand that it's, uh, it's there. And you don't only have to eat something which is roasted. If you have it, then you get 500 different flavors on your palate, on your mouth, and it, everything becomes more enjoyable. And there are many things like that, that uh, you find over here that we did not have in India. And there are simple things that you get, like scallops, which we can't get in India, but other seafood we do get. Yeah. So you're always trying to work out which is the best way to work with a particular product. Okay. So hopefully we are filming next week. And uh, on that, they have sent me some wild boar and some... Oh, and the barbell. Yeah. But uh, forgetting that that's the most common animal that the, gov the government allows you to kill in India is the wild boar. Mm. It'll be very much part and parcel of much of the food around some rural areas, which of course the city people never get to eat or taste or want to eat even. Yeah. And so that's something that we'll be working on, hopefully adding more taste and more flavor and making the Americans aware that you can change things rather than cooking it one basic smoking barbecue, smoking barbecue. Yeah. And it with these barbecue sauces that they're so popular or they are so uh engrossed or what enamored with you know all the time yeah because i because i think indian food is it's one of the misconceptions that, that i i come across living here when you say indian food they go oh my god it's so spicy and i, I get really frustrated by that because i'm like no indian food can be spicy but it's so flavorful flavorful because you get sharp cooling hot heat all in the one like all in one mouthful in one bite that's so, but it's the way you do it. And I'm trying to teach that to people here. And it's so difficult because I think they're just, 
blind to accepting that Indian food can be so colorful and flavorsome without having heat. And there are other ways to use it apart from having it with coconut. And I think a lot of people just prefer their korma here because that's the spiciest of what they can have. But I'm like... That was very, so... very similar in Britain at one time. Very, mm. very similar. They confuse spice with hot. Mm. That's the first problem. Spice is different to hot. Hot is caused by chili. Yeah. Spice is caused by the addition of spices which are colorful, which are flavorful, mm. which are a zing, but not necessarily the heat that upsets you. Yeah. So it, it is a common feature. It's nothing new. It's always constant. It happens all the time. Mm. And lots of people here refuse to move from certain, uh, you know, uh, certain uh, fixed uh, ideas in their minds. They come to a restaurant, they see things on the menu they're not familiar with, they'll walk away from the menu. Yeah, it's true. It's a shame. I think it's, again, like an education into other cuisines. And I think it's difficult because it involves a lot of work and patience as well. Um, which leads me on to, I recently had Tony on the podcast. And he's your other half of the Spice Men. Yep. And I mentioned to him that the energy between you was so eclectic and contagious in a very good way because you both very have a fantastic sense of humor um what was it like filming with him to awaken britain um in the pursuit of versatility of spices how was that i think it was a great experience in the first place my greatest experience was trying to understand how tony speaks <laughs> Yeah. yeah, super strong Scottish accent. <laughs> we'll struggle with that a lot. We speak a lot all the time. Yeah. Uh, we'll be on Saturday Kitchen next week together. Oh, lovely. This Saturday, the following Saturday. I know I'll just laugh because half the words I, he will swallow, I won't understand. <laughs> but we'll have a good time. And uh, the most that was fun. Number two is trying to understand him. is uh, And how he works. Because... It's not easy when he is constantly trying to come in to whatever you're trying to say. Okay. okay. Initial thing is he's trying to override everything I'm trying to say. And then you get to understand this man that he just can't help himself. He is like that. Okay. It's not that he is trying to be one up or one better, but that's his nature, that's his style. And yeah. he just won't stop talking. So then I learned afterwards, middle, uh, towards the middle of the uh, series. I said, just chef, hey, give me a chance to talk. I said, just shut up for a minute. <laughs> and then yeah, he would climb up. So, I mean, working with him, he's a very, very lovely guy to work with. He's full of fun. I have not grown up in this country, so I don't understand basic British humor. And uh, there are words that I am not familiar with because I came as a grown up man. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up. From, so, he throws some things that I've got no clue of. And all I can do is laugh because I wouldn't understand what he was trying to say. The others will guffaw because they understand what Tony is saying. I wouldn't understand. But I think uh, it works. Somehow it tends to work. And if it's going to work and if somebody will have us yeah. and do another series or two, I think it will be fun because there is so much more that we can show people. There's so Definitely. Because he said there could be something in the pipeline. So I was like keeping my fingers and toes crossed because I was like please can I like record this as well because just to be with you two I think it would be an amazing experience of just humor and banter I think but, but so many people have said yes 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 to throw many things doesn't work all the time so yeah. if he's excited I'm still not because we've been let down many many times the mm. show was extremely successful the moment we mentioned something the Instagram goes live again wow on live for next week's uh, Saturday Kitchen. And everyone's, uh, everybody is, as who knows us is commenting. They're looking yeah. forward, looking forward, looking forward. So it is a mistake I think the BBC made. I don't know. Yeah. It would have, it would have gone further afield. That would have been a great program because there's education, there is demystification, yeah. and there is simplicity. With two characters who are total opposites, but at the same time passionate about what they do. Definitely. And I think it's really good because not only could you do it in the UK, you could go to Europe or, yep. you know, Asia, like Asia, Europe, the States, Canada, wherever, because anyway. it, again, it's an education to the senses and the way you guys do it, 
it's just a fantastic partnership for me to see you guys together. So fingers crossed. So fingers, fingers crossed, definitely, definitely. But I have to ask, behind every successful man is an even more successful woman. Yeah. So, Pervin. Yeah. You are both known as a power couple, okay? And if you've seen my big fat Greek wedding, yeah, the mother says the man, the male does have the head, but the woman is the neck, and she can turn the head in any direction she wants to. Yep. What qualities do you? Because both of you are known for your qualities of entrepreneurship, trusting. It's a very special relationship. What qualities do you think it takes to have a relationship like both of you have in this uh, industry? Number one, number one is friendship. I think a lot of people don't understand how deep our friendship is. And trust is mm -hmm. all important. I travel, some, now it's been a bit slow after COVID or whatever, but I was traveling all the time. Mm -hmm. I had women around me all the time. Okay. Yeah. If she didn't trust me, she would have ob objections about where I went and with who I went and how I went. Okay. So that's number one, that's trust. And that's something that you could never... Betray. Number two is this understanding of each other's strengths. I think that's very, very yeah. important. How far a strength goes. No one is perfect in this world. There are millions of weaknesses. I have several weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, but it helps to compensate in that front because I know very well that my back is covered yeah. by mistakes and it will be it will be taken care of. And it's almost the danger is taking it for granted. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do very often, yeah. which is wrong. But it's just that you take it for granted, it's going to happen. The, so these are one or two or three different things. And respect, you see, is very, yeah. very critical. We manage, I mean, we've been working together now since 93 non-stop. So yeah. your troubles go back home and they come back from home into work and they go back again and they come back again. And the whole family gets involved in those issues. So... It's how you manage them and how well you handle them, I think. It's very That's important. Amazing. We have a good relationship on that front. And uh, dare anybody interfere with that. That's amazing. You've been warned, guys. <laughs> so, Pavin also graduated from the Institute of... Um, Catering Technology. Thank you. In, in, in Mumbai? Yeah. But so she also so she's also dabbled in the food industry and cooking. What is your favorite dish from Pervin that she cooks for you? So Pervin actually was desperate to become a chef. Okay. And she joined the Taj Mahal Hotel to become a chef. Okay. And at that time we had a talk and I said, listen, I said, if you work together in a kitchen, it's not going to be the best thing in the world. To okay. That. And uh, so then she decided that she'll sacrifice that and work in the restaurant and said on the front of house, okay. which she is absolutely brilliant at. There's no two ways about it. And I'm sure she would have been a brilliant chef too. There's no two ways about it. So very much into that cooking aspect. I will not cook breakfast at home. I will not. Okay. Because when she cooks my eggs, they taste uh -huh. different. Uh -huh. They just taste different. They just taste the best. I can fry a good egg. I can fry it extremely well. But no, when Pervin fries my eggs, they taste different. When <laughs> she makes the scrambled eggs, they taste different. So oh. there is some of those things. And uh, by and large, by and large, it is uh, on the domestic front. She is very much. She very much is the is the cook in the house. If she needs my help, I will help. Okay. But more or less. I do the odd jobs around the, around when people are coming and she has to do the main things. Sometimes okay. because it's reversed. But no. And anything she makes actually tastes wonderful. So I'm very happy with that. Oh, so lucky. I'm teaching Carlos how to cook um, Indian food. So hopefully one day we'll get there. But he is he's good. He's learning. Um, so you and Pervin founded the Zest Quest Asia, okay, to help chefs truly understand... Um, authentic Asian food. The competition has been running for a couple of years now. What made you start this up together? So, actually, I 
have been wanting to introduce Asian cookery within competitions for a very long time. And uh, going back quite a few years, we managed to convince uh, these people, one of my sponsors, to have a competition within the overall UK competitions for Craft Guild of Chefs to have something to do with rice and Asian cooking. Okay. So that was introduced. Then the other that happened was uh, in 1999, well, I was very much involved with training and development with the with some government bodies. Why don't we not have an, a cookery school with Asian and Oriental cooking? Mm. Along with two other restauranters, we approached the government office and asked them for some money to set up a school. So in 2000, somebody within government understood the need and gave us some money. But it was tied into another association. So you could not get the money in your hand. It had to be down. It had to be downloaded through a established entity. Anyway, we set up the Asian and Oriental School of Catering. And then government changed. The policies changed. Catering became unimportant to them. And the funding stopped. Okay. So the school had to close down. So that really upset me because we were the pioneers in setting up the world's first ever Asian and Oriental School of Catering. Okay. We did nearly put 1,000 young people into full-time jobs within those five years of operation. So, I kept meddling around it and I thought, why am I wasting my time trying to get kids off the street into thinking Asian? Rather, why don't we try and influence young people who want to become chefs to also look at Asian cuisine? Okay. I, I sit on the committee of the Master Chefs of Great Britain. And the master chefs of Great Britain at that time were not doing extremely well. And we needed something to push it up. Okay. So I put it forward to the committee that we should have a competition that is purely directed towards Asian Oriental cooking. So everybody agreed. We launched it at Cafe Spice the first time. Uh -huh. The master chefs were, as usual, in it, not in it. So anyway, we thought we'll take it forward, we'll drive it forward. And then since then, we have driven it forward. So it then became Zest Quest Asia from the Junior Asian Chefs Challenge to Zest Quest Asia. It's now 10 years old. Wow. And uh, it has become the most successful inter-college student competition in Britain today because the prize is big. Everybody's mm -hmm. vying for it. It's a lot of work. I've got, I've got lots of things to do still, mm -hmm. even now. But we did a dinner last week at Loughborough College, one of the prizes uh -huh. for the best team was that we would go into the college and kick up, cook up a meal funded by us. So the college didn't have to spend any money on raw materials. And whatever money came in, the college would use that money for education. Towards okay. the student. But we unfortunately couldn't make it because our chef's father passed away, so he was stuck in India. So I went alone, along with a very dear friend of ours, called Sarah Hartnett, who was once voted best pastry chef in the country. Mm. And the gentleman in, under whose name we launched this award, Andrew Bennett, was a very dear friend, the first chairman of our uh, judges. And he was always motivated and motivating young people. And team spirit was the most important thing. So we launched the uh, award in his honor just last this year. And the prize was that they would come to the restaurant, we would give them a treat and uh, give them a little demo and then we would go back to their restaurant and then set up a dinner. Okay. So that's what happened last week. The school has raised quite a bit of money, which is very good because they're ticketed event. And hopefully this will keep going and it might grow further. That's the whole idea. Wow. That's amazing. You actually went to Loughborough where I'm from. So just to hear Loughborough College, I was like, oh, wow. So I haven't been back in years, but I will actually grow up in Loughborough. So, uh, we did the dinner at Loughborough College. That's amazing. Oh, well, hope you had a good time there. Yeah, so, very hectic, it was hectic, hectic, but it's good. Oh, God. So, my last question for you. You are known for applying the Babsi ethos of, philanth of philanthropy. Can sorry, you explain? Sir? Sorry. You... You're known for applying the Babsi ethos of philanthropy. Can't say that anymore. Um, can you explain more about that? The Parsi ethos 
Mm. Uh, the, the first person he thought is eat as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'll join you there. <laughs> yeah, eat, enjoy life, have fun. But it's uh, the three main tenets of the religion are good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Mm. Okay. The other thing it teaches is charity until death and beyond death. And happiness to those that bring happiness unto others. Mm. And these are very small basic principles of the religion. You have to apply that because I think all of life is based around these very simplistic philosophies. They're very simplistic. There is nothing extraordinary about them. They are simple. And uh, we bring that into the food maybe once a month when we have this thing called the Greedy Pigs Club as well. Yeah. And uh, that's the time we get to do only Parsi food. But every time now we are changing as well. So this month is Keralan food. Next oh, month will be Punjabi food. And then for the 100th Greedy Pigs dinner, it will be all Parsi food again. Oh, and, wow. So uh, the whole ethos is camaraderie, friendship, love, affection, enjoyment together. So oh, we never lovely. broke tables up. Now we have to break tables up because of COVID and people's brains have gone a little bit fussy. Mm. But we just seat them in the Parsi style, long tables, people sitting opposite each other. Yeah. And from there, so many friendships have evolved. And so many of those people have actually gone on holidays together even. Oh, wow. And they come together for the dinner. So there's, uh, there's a bit of that. There's a lot of that. The other, of course, thing is to be respectful of everybody else around you and everyone's religions. Mm. And and that, that was the philosophy of Cyrus the Great of Persia who was the first uh, man to introduce a human rights charter. And um, those are the basic principles. We go by that. We enjoy okay. that. We love by that. And we have loads of friends we have a good banter and fun with. Oh, it's not... about food. Oh, that's so lovely. Honestly, like, you are my encyclopedia of, like, just facts and food-related facts. It's, it's amazing. I've learned so much from you today. It's been amazing. I, I have to say, thank you so much for joining me today. And... For all of you listeners, if you want to see more of Cyrus's work, please follow him at Cyrus Toddy on Instagram. And um, I can't wait to see what this year has in store for you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you. And look forward to catching you in Granada. Granada. Yes, of course. We have to make a date of it. So I can't wait. I'm just going to feed you lots of food. So thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.